good afternoon. On behalf of our chairman, Bob Wright, we welcome you to our 76th season. Unfortunately, Bob cannot be with us today. As many of you know, Bob is receiving chemotherapy treatments for a curable form of cancer. And as Bob said to me as he was watching NBC News, of course, he, he said he needed to take it easy today. And as we know our fearless leader, I promise you that you will see Bob Wright very soon. Today represents the first of this season's speaker series programs. For the past few years, the Palm Beach Civic Association has offered our members the benefit of hearing from dynamic keynote speakers, many of whom are our members, directors, and residents of Palm Beach. Ambassadors, authors, and significant leaders have enriched us with their experiences and insights. Now, in our 76th season, we are launching the Global Speaker Series with focus on issues impacting our world, immigration, national security, our ocean and environment, along with finance and philanthropy. The entire schedule is in your program today, so please mark your calendars and plan to attend. You may even wish to invite a friend and encourage them to support the Civic Association and all that we do to enrich our community. We are grateful to our supporters, our directors, members, and sponsors. Your dues and donations allow us not only to bring you programs like this, but also produce weekly news. We are Palm Beach's only producer of live news with Tim Malloy anchoring our newscast. And where is Tim Malloy? There he is, and Tim's doing just a wonderful job bringing news to us. So please watch our This Week in Palm Beach, and trust me, as I said, you don't want to miss what's happening in our town. Today's Global Series program is sponsored by the Stanley M. Rumbo Legacy Society Fund. When a legacy is established, we believe it is most meaningful to always remember and honor its namesake, which is very fitting and touching in many great ways. Because when I first introduced Stan Rumbo to our keynote speakers, Austin Fragaman and Gwen Robison, over 20 some years ago at dinner, while Yana Rumbo was away competing in a dressage Grand Prix championship, I asked Stan to tell Gwen and Austin a little bit about himself, to which Stan replied to me, in his Stan way, Mary, you can tell them. And so I began. Stan served in World War II as a US Marine fighter pilot and was awarded two distinguished fly cross and eight air medals. Stan flew 50 combat missions. Stan was a graduate of Yale University, a founder, CEO, director of more than 40 companies. Stan co-founded Citizens for Eisenhower and served as special assistant to President Eisenhower in the White House from 1953 to 1955. Stan was a founding member of Young Presidents Organization and the World Presidents Organization. Stan was chairman of the US Committee for the United Nations and the Foreign Policy Association. And as for hobbies, Stan had a passion for sports like no other. And get ready to hear this, he played Wimbledon, Roland Garris, Forest Hills, and tied the course record at Shinnecock Golf Club with a 68 that he scored in 1959. But what Stan loved to talk about most was Palm Beach. He first visited Palm Beach over a half century ago and said Palm Beach was love at first sight. Stan became a Civic Association director for more than 40 years and 10 years served as co-chairman and was the CEO from 2006 to 2009. Stan had a unique gift and ability to reach out to virtually every group, every group in Palm Beach, and he was endlessly dedicated to making our town a better place. And speaking of making our town a better place, I wish to recognize our town council members that are here today. Will you please stand? Maggie Zeidman, Bobby Lindsay, and also I believe our town manager Jay Budishwa is here. Thank you. 
On behalf of the Civic Association, we thank you and Mayor Gail Coniglione and Town Council President Donnie Moore, along with Council Members Lou Crampton and Julie Ariscog for your dedicated commitment of service to our town and citizens. We at the Civic Association hold our relationship with you in the highest regard. As Bob Wright was quoted when Stan passed away in September of 2017, Bob said in his interview, Stan persuaded me to become involved with the Civic Association, proposing me as a member after we met some 18 years ago. And in Bob Wright's words, as he said this morning, as he was lowering the volume to NBC News, he said to me, Stan touched people's lives in the most meaningful and compelling ways. Stan truly was a remarkable man. And speaking of being remarkable, Yana Rumbo is here today. And it was Yana, along with Nina and young Stan Rumbo, that they established the Stanley M. Rumbo Legacy Society with a gift of $1 million. Yana, will you please stand? <laughs> Yana, we thank you, and we welcome you as a new director. The Rumbo Legacy Fund is now growing with additional donors, and many of you are here today. We thank you on behalf of the Rumbo family because of your support. This fund will continue to grow to serve our community and educate our citizens in perpetuity. And in closing, as Stan used to tell me, as my first mentor and dear friend for 30 years, Stan would always say to me, Mary, do your best. Do your best. So in doing my best, I ask for your consideration of making a gift or planned gift in time to our Legacy Society. On behalf of Chair Chairman Bob Wright, we are grateful knowing that leadership and legacies begin with our citizens. Thank you and enjoy lunch. I'm Michael Ainsley, and I'm pleasure, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Fragaman is the leading law firm in the world, dedicated exclusively to immigration services. Since the early 50s, Fragaman has represented a broad range of companies, organizations, and individuals to help facilitate the transfer of employees worldwide. Whether they're providing pro bono support to unaccompanied minors from Central America and helping them obtain special immigrant juvenile status, or working with persons who are well known in helping them navigate the immigration process to ultimately convince the immigration examiner that they are, in fact, a person of extraordinary ability, their work is rewarding and diverse. They are an American Law 100 and a Global Law 100 firm, and their professionals are respected throughout the world. Austin Fragaman is the firm's chairman and founder. Over the course of his career in immigration, he first served as staff counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives Subcommittee on Immigration. And I like to tell this story about Austin because he came out of his job as that staff director for that committee, and he said, there's nobody out there really focusing on immigration. It's a back-of-the-house activity for a lot of law firms, but nobody's really doing a first-rate professional job. So he began this firm and really has built it into a world leader. He uh, also is an adjunct professor in law at New York University law School of Law. He has testified on a wide range of immigration subjects before Congress, most recently before the Ways and Means Committee on how to enforce immigration laws at the workforce. When Robison, his partner and wife, who also happens to be the sister of our Mary Robison, is the firm partner and member of its executive committee, Gwen practices corporate immigration law and is experienced in due diligence considerations related to mergers, acquisitions, takeovers, downsizing, etc. 
She focuses on corporate mobility concerns affecting the employment of global professional, uh, professionals all over the world, and she performs audits of U.S. immigration programs. She also handles the Department of Labor regulations affecting the employment of foreign workers in the U.S. Austin and Gwen have a home here in Palm Beach. They, uh, Austin just became a new director of the Civic Association, and on a personal side, these two are remarkable. They are competitive ocean sailors, just having won their division of the Miami to Palm Beach, the Sailfish Club Open Ocean Racing uh, a competition just a few weeks ago. That makes me very impressed. They're also uh, avid skiers with a home in Utah and preservationists. They've just finished restoring a home on Clark Avenue a couple of years ago. So it's our great pleasure to have them speaking to us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. After a few minutes of comments, they will uh, do a Q&A session as well. Michael, thank you for your remarks. Um, Austin and I are delighted to be here today to address the members of the Palm Beach Civic Association and the directors. Um, we're fairly new to the Civic Association and you know, note that the outreach to the community, the work that's being done is really remarkable and very, um, very laudable. Um, so I'd like to begin our session today with um, a question to Austin. So Austin, you know, we read every day and see on the news stories of thousands of migrants who are leaving their home countries. They're placed in peril in the seas off the coast of Italy and Spain. We see uh, European migrants um, being placed at risk every day in Asia and on the south border, the southern border of the United States. Could you um, share with us some of your uh, insights on the circumstances that these mm -hmm. large populations are addressing? Well, um, why don't we start with the, um, with the border? Um, now, we have there a picture of the fence. Um, and that's what the fence looks like. And there's only going to be about 1,000 miles of it. Um, and you can see, um, you know, as the, um, uh, as, as the president has stated, that it's a beautiful fence, right? Everyone's agreed it's a beautiful fence. I, I personally prefer the Great Wall of China, but, um, you know, I like the turrets better. Um, but in any event, um, <clears throat> that is the fence. Um, during the Obama administration, um, it, there actually was a fairly big issue on the border as well, where their apprehensions were about 500,000. Uh, a year of people coming across the um, border with Mexico, um, which is, you know, fairly, uh, fairly significant number of people, needless to say. Um, and when they talk about apprehension, just in um, terms of the trade, um, they talk about people who actually came across the border in places that were, um, you know, where they were able to get in and were apprehended once they arrived in the U.S. Um, and people who are inadmissible, as they call them, meaning they surrender themselves at a point of entry and say, I want to apply for asylum or, or whatever. So they add those two together, and that's apprehensions. Um, you know, it's kind of an odd way of looking at things since one group actually surrendered. They weren't really apprehended. Um, in any event, <clears throat> so the wall, um, the wall is a... Uh, uh, you know, very controversial issue, and I'm sure that um, you know many of you um, stumble across various articles about court cases challenging um, the uh, funding of the wall, and Congress has um, made it very difficult. And um, the funding has um, been uh, pretty sparse for the wall, um, but the administration has redirected um, discretionary funds they have were appropriated primarily for the. Department of Defense and use those to fund the wall. Now, um, there was a recent, um, actually last week, a federal uh, appeals court decision that um, basically held that, um, that an injunction that stopped the transfer of that money was um, improper and that it was, um, that it was illegal for the president to, to use those funds. <clears throat> 
Now, of course, when we talk about a wall, there doesn't really have to be um, a solid barrier along the whole border. Um, when you've seen um, films of the border, you can see that um, some, there are a lot of areas that really don't lend itself to that. Um, and there is effectively an electronic border with sensors and detectors and um, things of that sort, um, border patrol officers and helicopters, et cetera. So the question is, well, does the border work? And, and, and I mean, does the, does the border wall work in terms of the deterring people from coming? Um, certainly it's, um, it's decreased illegal entry in the areas where there is a wall. Um, the number of illegal entrants go down substantially, um, although one doesn't know whether they're just going to a different border point, so we'll see ultimately um, what happens. Um, it seems as though there's a, um, uh, you know, a uh, high priority um, among uh, the people who enter the U.S. without inspection to, to get into the country somewhere, so they're, um, and they're assisted by, um, by alien smugglers, which is a, a pretty big business. Um, in addition, um, after many fits and starts and lawsuits, which the administration lost, um, they finally have come up with a combination of activities that, that actually are somewhat effective in discouraging um, migrants from coming to the United States. Um, first of all, they've increased uh, border patrol agents. They've entered into agreements with Mexico, and as you, as you all know, the next country south of Mexico is Guatemala. Um, they've entered into agreements with those countries to protect their borders um, so that no one gets into their countries um, from Honduras, El Salvador, um, et cetera, and comes, um, comes to the United States. Um, they also um, uh, have um, adopted a, um, a policy where um, where when asylum, when, when somebody comes into the U.S. and, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, has to travel through other countries, um, they've come up with a policy where they're not allowed to apply for asylum if, if this wasn't the first country they came to. The idea being that if they, you know, if they left um, Honduras, um, and they're a true political asylee, they should have applied in Guatemala or Mexico, um, and therefore they could deny them the right to apply in the U.S. Um, this is fairly consistent with, um, you know, international standards of, um, of, of refugee law. There's a, um, there's a uh, particular um, interpretation of that that's pursuant to uh, um, a agreement between European countries that follow that, um, that theory. Um, there's, the, um, there's also the um, policy change, which you probably, most of you probably heard about, um, which um, you, you hear about this idea of catch and release. And the idea is that if someone comes into the country, applies for asylum, or applies at the border, they used to, quote, parole them into the United States and allow them to remain in the United States until they um, would have a hearing, um, which, um, which would take years for that to occur. So therefore, that was an incentive in and of itself um, to um, attempt to enter the country. Um, then they um, <clears throat> uh, came up with the idea of, um, well, um, if you didn't have a child with you, um, then they would keep you in a detention center. But if you had a child, because there was a federal court case that held that um, children had to be released from custody within 20 days of being apprehended, um, that they would let the parents, um, they would parole them into the country as well, right? So there became a premium on having a child with you. And of course, the smugglers are very smart. So then there was a, um, a whole market in, um, in, in, in arranging for children to go with unrelated people um, so that it would appear that they were a family unit. And at that point, we had the administration's reaction was lock them all up. Um, we'll, we'll turn the children over to child services and we'll um, prosecute the, um, the parents and the other people they're with. And in fact, at one point, they even prosecuted parents for um, uh, smuggling, 
um, by bringing children into the country. Um, in any event, um, those policies um, seem to have ceased now. Um, and instead, what we have is an arrangement um, whereby persons awaiting asylum cases aren't, don't wait in the U.S. anymore. We made a deal with Mexico, so they stay in Mexico um, rather than um, waiting in the United States. And that is called the Remain in Mexico program. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, um, they have... Um, they have, you'll see the, um, it's my statistic, I put my glasses on here. Okay. Um, you can see the, um, the statistics there for asylees and refugees. We go backwards there? Yeah. yeah. Let's go backwards one. Do you have back another one? One more. Okay. There we go. Those are overall apprehensions. So you can see that in fiscal year, um, 2019, which ended on um, October, or, uh, on uh, September 30th, um, they, their apprehensions were 977,000. Um, and um, uh, for the first three months of the new fiscal year, the apprehensions have been 45,000, 42,000, and in December were 40,000. So you can see that these um, uh, that these new efforts have, um, have, have actually been uh, fairly effective. Um, so there were a couple of interpretations that were very important um, that also limited the number of uh, persons um, who could apply for asylum. Um, and um, one of the um, interpretations was one that um, essentially um, said that um, you could not apply for asylum if you're freeing from domestic violence. Um, there was a, um, a under international law, normally to be a refugee, you have to be fleeing based on a well-founded fear of persecution, based on race, religion, national origin, or membership in a particular social group, um, which in many cases could be um, uh, a gang or something of that sort. Um, so in any event, um, they extended that. The Obama administration extended that to fleeing domestic violence. And they also extended it, and this was really important, um, to prosecution by non-governmental authorities. And the idea there was that if you were being you know, persecuted, I should say persecution, not prosecution, persecution um, by non-governmental authorities, so if you were um, if you were being subject to um, harassment or um, harm by a gang in El Salvador, you could apply for political asylum. Well, the Trump administration did away with that interpretation. The Attorney General um, handed down these, um, these new interpretations. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of the situation along the border. Um, of course, we're not the... You know, we're not the only ones, as, as Gwen's question asked, um, who have these problems with, um, um, with illegal migration. This is a massive worldwide problem. Um, and um, it's simply driven by people looking for economic betterment, in addition to people being bona fide you know, refugees, um, where they're fleeing from um, persecution in their country or um, they're fleeing from um, the effects of um, climate change. That's a fairly common situation that we, we, we see now. Um, and it, the, the, um, the, the specific issues from a legal standpoint vary by location. Um, for instance, um, Spain and Italy, they, they have a big problem with people coming in boats, right? And you forever seeing pictures in the press of the boat turning upside down and people drowning and um, boats floating around and um, the Italians won't let them land and um, then they have to negotiate somewhere else to go, um, et cetera. And this is all just a, a manifestation of the same problem. In fact, the, um, the Italians um, have um, you know, basically um, convinced uh, most, of the, the, most of the Africans coming to the country the point of embarkation is in Libya so they now have um, you know, worked out arrangements within Libya, which as you know, doesn't really have a, 
um, a, uh, you know, it has a civil war going on, and the government really doesn't have control over the, um, the, the, the country. Um, so they actually are engaged in um, programs like um, going to Libya and destroying small boats um, along the coastline um, to prevent, um, prevent this from happening. The Australians um, probably have the most extreme solution, which is they, um, they hire the um, island country of um, Nauru, which is a population of 14,000, um, but it's a country. Um, believe it or not, by the way, it's the third smallest country. There are three, two countries smaller than 14,000. Um, but in any event, um, when they interdict people at sea um, in Australia, when their Coast Guard does, um, they send them to Nauru to be detained until they can hold a, um, uh, a deportation, an asylum uh, interview in, um, in Nauru. So this is... Um, you know, this is kind of where we are at the moment with, um, with borders. Um, so um, what, what happens to the people who, um, and I'm particularly interested in the United States, what happens to the people who are not apprehended, the ones who are able to come in without lawful status and not be apprehended? Well, they're, they're somewhere between um, 11 and 12 million um, irregular migrants, illegal aliens, um, undocumented aliens, whatever you want to call them. Well, the UN calls them irregular migrants. Um, you know, gives them a, you know, a, little, a little more uh, cachet. Um, and about half of them enter the country um, by coming over the border, like the Mexican border. Um, far fewer over the Canadian border. Although, not surprisingly, the harder you make it to get in, over the um, Mexican border, the more people they apprehend coming over the Canadian border, um, and the more people they apprehend coming by boats to Florida um, and, and other southern uh, entry points. But the other half are visa violators, people who come into the U.S. as students or visitors or whatever and just never leave, or come in under visa waiver programs, um, et cetera. Um, so, of course, we have, um, we have the border enforcement. Then we have, um, for people who come into the country, um, the immigration authorities don't, um, don't track people who don't um, leave. So if someone comes into the country as a visitor and doesn't leave, um, then they just don't leave, and no one goes looking for them. Um, but quite to the contrary, um, they, may, um, they may be picked up by um, immigration authorities in the U.S. by um, an organization called ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. They get a lot of bad publicity, right? The politicians want to abolish ICE, um, or some of the politicians want to abolish ICE. We're not exactly sure um, what, what good that's going to serve, um, because then um, there won't be any immigration enforcement. So there are sanctuary cities, and we've heard about sanctuary cities. And that just means that the, that particular location won't assist the federal authorities in um, trying to um, arrest or deny benefits, um, particularly social benefits, um, to um, undocumented aliens. But it also means, which is, which is probably a bad thing, um, that if uh, an alien is arrested uh, for a criminal law violation, um, and is released on bond, that person um, is not turned over to the immigration authorities in a sanctuary city. Or if a person serves time in prison for, say, a felony when they're released, um, they do not get turned over to ICE for deportation. They just remain in the U.S. even though they have no legal status. Um, so that's one of the downsides, <coughs> I would suggest, of. Um, of the sanctuary city is that they don't work with the immigration authorities. Then we have workplace enforcement, and many of you probably heard of the, um, or, or saw the more recent enforcement actions against chicken processing plants in, um, in the South. And of course, chicken processing is not something that, um, that Americans find is a very popular activity. 
And in fact, there are a number of these activities, even though they pay union wages in their union jobs, there just doesn't seem to be anybody who's interested in doing them. Um, so um, the, um, this, this tends to attract um, undocumented workers who hear this is the place you can get hired. Now, how do they get hired? Well, <clears throat> you know, if you um, produce identification that says that you're a citizen or an alien or whatever, um, the employer um, has to accept that identification. And as long as it's, um, it looks facially valid, um, it's discrimination for the employer to ask for other information beyond um, the minimum amount that has to be presented. And you can, there's a whole government agency that enforces discrimination against persons in the workplace because you ask for other documents to show they could legally work. Um, so the employer is caught kind of in a bad position. Um, there's just massive document fraud and fake identity. Um, the um, government statistics, when I mentioned it was testified before the um, Ways and Means Committee, um, part of Part of why I was representing the um, Society for Human Resources Management uh, in terms of a number of, you know, on, on um, uh, interior enforcement. But one of the statistics that I used was that 50% of the persons that are apprehended working illegally in the U.S., 50% of them have false documents showing that they're entitled to work. Um, so that's, and we're talking here millions of people, millions of people. So that's how out of control this uh, situation is. And of course, these people, many of them, um, many of them are union jobs, but uh, some are not. Some are um, just work for cash. So there's uh, quite a uh, massive um, underground economy um, as well. Um, and one of the biggest problems, the biggest problem is, is what happens to these people that are here illegally can they ever correct their status? Is it possible for them to ever regularize it? Um, so Glenn, what is, what's been um, your experience with persons who are here out of status? Well, <clears throat> the difficulty with individuals who are here without status is that there's a law that if you are here unlawfully for more than six months and you leave the country, that you're uh, barred from coming back for a period of three years. And if you are here for a period of more than a year and you leave the country, you're barred from returning for a period of 10 years. So if you came and say you were here for eight months without underlying status, your employer went through the process to secure resident status for you, went through a Department of Labor test, and had you have an immigrant visa available, you can't convert because you've been here unlawfully. And if you leave, you're barred from returning for three or 10 years. So it's a really, um, you know, it's a real dilemma uh, because there's really no solution with very limited exceptions. So I think that that's an area that, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about having another amnesty program. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, ideally Congress would address at some point. So um, um, I thought I would take a couple of minutes and talk about um, talk about employment-based immigration. Um, so <clears throat> in our immigration framework, there are um, two categories. They're referred to as non-immigrants, persons who are coming here temporarily, and immigrants, which is synonymous with green card. Um, but I think, you know, before we talk about the categories, um, I would just like to share some information about, um, about the foreign national population. So today, 14% of the US population is foreign born. As of 2019, 223 companies of the Fortune 500 were founded by immigrants or by their children. And of those companies, 101 companies were founded directly by foreign-born individuals. The other 122 companies were founded by the children of immigrants. So these companies together employ about 13 and a half million people. And so there's a real benefit that the U.S. is receiving from, um, from immigrants, um, uh, you know, to our economy, to the sciences, um, to innovation. Um, 
you can see from this chart that 38% um, of Americans who won Nobel Prizes in chemistry, medicine, and physics since the year 2000 were naturalized US citizens, so persons who went through the whole immigration process. And six of the 19 um, Nobel Prize winners in economics were naturalized citizens. Um, if we look to you know, who's studying at our US universities, um, here are the um, percentages of foreign students in you know, the, the fields that you know, really drive the economy and drive innovation and drive improvement in quality of life. So you can see electrical engineering, 81% of the graduates are foreign students, and petroleum engineering, computer science, and on and on. So I would just you know, share that with you as far as in terms of you know, the, the benefits that, um, that foreign nationals are bringing to the United States. Um, for the, for the employment-based categories, there are four categories that are most relevant uh, on the temporary visa side. And the categories are the H-1B, which is for professional employment. You've probably heard about that. There are 85,000 H-1B visas allocated every fiscal year. The demand exceeds availability threefold and more. So the government runs a lottery. Um, and so there's really no certainty of result. Have an H-1B worker come and join your organization because it's you know your chances are one in three. The L category is another frequently used category. It's used by multinational companies to transfer executives and managers from overseas affiliates into the United States. Um, the O category is for persons of extraordinary ability. And then there's an E category, which is for uh, persons who were born in a country that has a treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation with the United States. And so the E category is used for investment in the United States and also to carry out substantial trade. So your large foreign-based companies, the German chemical companies, French yogurt makers, British Airways, <laughs> these are all users of the E category. And it also could be used, say, for a French person to come and open a restaurant in Palm Beach. Um, so, so that's the E category. So those are the, those are the primary um, work permits that are used by American employers. And the issue that we're facing now with these, um, with these employment-based categories is that within three months of the um, president taking office, he issued an, an executive order that's referred to as Buy American, Hire American. And it essentially directed the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Labor, and the, um, the head of the Department of Homeland Security to examine all of our immigration policies and to ensure that the policies and, and new regulations and new um, uh, rules were being written to ensure that the executive order was being carried out. And what's happened as a result of that is we've seen just a surge in the number of um, requests for additional evidence for the H-1B visas. Uh, we've seen an increase in the denial rate. And the same holds true with the L category. Um, so we've seen, you know, just real spikes in rejections of cases and uh, decline in overall approval ratings. Um, as part of the executive order, there were two memos that were issued that were really, um, as lawyers, we found to be very offensive. Um, one was that uh, a memo directed all of, the, all of the adjudicators, so everyone making decisions at the field offices, to not give any deference to a prior approval of a case for the same person for the same job. So we've seen clients who have been in the United States four, five, and six years who file for an extension of their status and the uh, case is denied. And in some instances, people have had to leave the country. One of the most egregious cases that I got involved with was for a dancer um, at one of the top ballet companies in the country and he had been here as an O1, which is the extraordinary ability category, for five years. He had had 
two extensions of his stay. And when the company filed for an extension, his case was denied, and he had to leave the country. And then we got involved and, and helped get it sorted out. Um, but these occurrences are creating um, you know, a level of um, unsettlement with the, with the employee population and those who you know, historically would have been interested in coming to the United States. Uh, it's very disconcerting. Um, and so you know, while the administration talks about having the best and the brightest come to the United States, what we see uh, at the, at the um, agency level is activity that's quite contrary to that statement. Um, so, Austin, um, with, with this uh, sort of background, what are some of your thoughts on, on what immigration reform should be uh, pursued and, and what would be helpful um, to this environment? Yeah, I mean, one of, the, um, you know, one of the big problems, of course, is political. Um, and as you, um, you know, as you all appreciate, um, the chance of getting anything done legislatively um, is pretty close to zero, particularly if it's immigration policy, um, which is inherently controversial. Um, so until we have um, until we have the current political situation um, resolved in that in that we need to have an environment where the two parties can work together in order to legislate. And immigration's never easy. Um, you can look back, and from the time I worked for Congress um, through now, there's never been any, uh, a widely accepted bipartisan immigration bill, and these are always very difficult. So appreciating that very little is probably going to happen short term, um, you need, and by the way, the, the, this political problem with migration is a, is a worldwide problem, as you know. I mean, if you think about um, to what extent did migration contribute to President Trump's um, victory, it was not inconsiderable. It was one of the major causes of Brexit. Um, and the, the major thing that really started Brexit was the uh, Eastern European new members of the EU um, having lots of workers go to the UK. I mean, that's really what kicked it off, um, was this free movement. Um, aspect um, under um, under Brexit, and we can see this problem um, even even occurring in some of the most liberal pro-immigration countries in the world. You know, like Germany, for instance, accepted a million Syrian um, immigrants, and of course that probably um, was the major factor in um, in finishing off um, you know uh, the prime minister's career. Um, in Sweden, even in Sweden, who had actually accepted um, 400,000 Syrians, which based on their population of 10 million is actually a higher percentage than, um, than Germany. Um, so this is a very, very volatile issue. In terms of um, what needs to be done in the U.S., um, I think they, the, um, one of the important factors is you have to get demography lined up with immigration. And, all, and this isn't just a U.S. problem, this is a worldwide problem. Um, and essentially, you, you need to um, look at what the need is in a particular country for workers. And if your fertility rate's very low, like the U.S. is now 1.7, which means that we're gonna, we're gonna lose population. Um, and the only reason we don't lose population already is because we have the most immigrants of any country in the world. We have a million immigrants a year, um, basically. Um, but even at a million a year, depending on the fertility rate, we, need, we, need, we may de even need to increase that um, in order to um, have workers. But what you want to do is you want to choose who comes, not have them choose you. Um, and that's why um, border controls are important. Um, the Trump administration um, talks about <clears throat> wanting to shift from family-based migration more to skill-based migration. 
Um, but so far, um, uh, they, we, 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 haven't, um, we haven't seen the result of a lot of work that's being done in the White House to create a bill. And we've been, um, you know, we've, we've uh, been consulted on that and have, you know, uh, an insight into some of the ideas, um, some of which are better than others, um, not surprisingly. Um, but in any event, um, we, need to have, um, we need to have legislative reform. Um, and what would you say, Gwen? What would you, in terms of um, different things that might be done? Well, I think, um, you know, certainly there's a huge backlog in immigrant visa availability. So if you want to get a green card today, um, based on your country of birth, the waiting period can be well beyond 10 years. So I think that you know maybe we need to have a better balance um, between family-based immigration and employment-based immigration. Uh, that would be one of my sort of mm. hopes. Um, and I also think that um, we we need to address the 10 plus million undocumented workers because it's really not um, it's not sustainable to have them mm. continue to you know not be able to regularize their status. So I, I think that some program of a pathway to, to lawful status would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And there are a few different solutions there. You can either have a general amnesty. Um, that's generally not liked by countries because it's been proven beyond any doubt um, that that encourages a new flow of irregular migrants. Um, once there's an amnesty, we had one in 86. Um, in, uh, um, we had an amnesty where we legalized about six million um, persons that were here without status. Um, the, another way of doing it is um, only giving um, status to persons who've been here for a requisite number of years, like 10 years or some um, longer period. Um, you've heard of this category that we'll refer to as the dreamers, right? These young people who came here um, when they were, um, you know, under the age of 16 and they've um, came to the U.S. and they've lived here for five years and, you know, got a clean record and whatever. And there are about um, 800,000 of um, persons under this program, which is, is, is awaiting a decision by the Supreme Court. The arguments, uh, the oral arguments were made a couple weeks ago. Um, and as to whether this program was legally um, adopted by the Obama administration and whether it was um, um, legally rescinded by the Trump administration. So there are actually two, two different issues, one on whether it was legal to start with and number two is um, whether it was rescinded. Um, but in any event, that, that might cause um, some actual resolution of this. Um, so we have that group. We have a group um, called Temporary Protected Status where we gave permission to stay in the United States to a number of people from uh, mainly Caribbean islands, um, uh, South America, et cetera, as a result of earthquakes and floods and natural disasters, many of whom have been here for 10 years, and there are about 500,000 of them. Um, so the point is we have many of these people who've been here for years and years, um, and there's no way to legalize their status, so there has to be, um, at some point, there should be some sort of amnesty where there's no way we're gonna round them all up and, and, um, and make them all go home. That's not gonna happen. And I think starving them out um, by you know, making sure we cut off all benefits to them is completely counterproductive like not letting their children go to school, um, which has been declared unconstitutional by, um, by federal courts. So in any event, um, this will be um, a very big issue, and this is probably the most controversial issue. So um, any questions from anyone? Uh, so. The, uh, your comment about the uh, dancer who was not allowed to bring it. Do you have any feeling for why they turned him down? Um, you know, my view is that, um, so there was this policy memorandum that was issued that said that the um, adjudicators, so the, the persons making the decision uh, for immigration, did not have to give any deference to a prior approval, right? 
So, you know, my sort of jaded view is that that memorandum gave the adjudicators the power to do what they wanted and to ignore regulation and to act at a grassroots level. But well, why would they? If there was a person of talent? Then... Because I think that they're taking the executive order to heart, right? They're, they're saying the executive order says buy American, hire American, and the denial decision you know, made comments like the ballet company wasn't renowned. Well, it's one of the top five in the world, and people have written about it. So um, I, it's a hard question to answer. I mean, what would motivate someone to deny that case other than um, perhaps, you know, some, some sort of sense that this is what the administration wants? They don't want cases to be approved. And, um, and, you know, sort of not embracing employment-based immigration. In other words, irrational. Irrational, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so along those lines, you said roughly eight out of ten STEM graduate students are, are foreign-born in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. With graduate, de uh, graduate degrees, right. though, not, not undergraduate. Right. Yeah. So what percentage of those do you think would like to stay and work in the U.S.? And what percentage? get that opportunity, and how are companies who need those students dealing with it? So it's a good question. So, so the students are here in F status, which is the student visa category. And the student visa category, if you're in a STEM field, has, following your graduation, a period of about 23 months of employment. You have to have a job. You have to have an employer. But there's work <coughs> authorization that attaches to the student visa. And from there, the employer will, will file an H-1B. That's the customary path. And the challenge for the employer and for the student is that you know, your chance of being selected in the lottery based on the demand for H-1Bs in light of availability, you, know, you have a 30% chance of being selected. So the H-1B lottery is administered every year, and so a foreign student in a graduate program in STEM would have essentially three chances to get an H-1B. Um, you know, they'd file every year. And if they're not selected, there's, you know, there's really no other approach other than looking to the O category. So we've done a lot of work for very bright scientists and engineers, where even though they're young in their career, um, they've done extraordinary work and made extraordinary contributions. And the O category can be explored for that purpose. Um, years ago, I, in one of my first O cases, I wrote for um, a woman whose field was wound healing and collagen synthesis in animals. And I, enter, I interviewed someone at the National Institutes of Health to help write the case. And the woman, the, the chair of the department at NIH said to me, you should take another biology course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. But, but the, and, you know, in, in, in um, uh, the, um, what was the? What, the O? Oh, yeah, well, that, we'll just take the next question, yeah. Uh, it's two parter. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, I made a D in geography, so can you tell me the two countries smaller? Than <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, when has there been a historical precedent uh, to what we're experiencing now, which is rising nationalism, rising protectionism, and rising migration trends? Well, I th I think you know um, what what we have is. Um, we have a situation which is a function of world population. The, um, that's really the heart of the problem. Because right now, the world population is 7.7 .7 billion, right? 7.7 .7 billion. Um, and if you, if, you, if you assume a fertility rate of 2.2, I mean, excuse me, 2.0, Right, the population will be 11.5 billion by the year 2000, by the year 2200, right? 2100, I'm sorry, 2100. By 2100, right, it'll be 11 billion. Um, but, but the fertility rate's actually 
probably going to be higher than that. It's already worldwide. It's um, 2.5 billion. If, and if that continues, then that number instead of 11 billion will be about 18 billion. So what, what you have is you have, and of course the population growth is in countries that are poorer countries um, because they're the ones with the high fertility rates. The, the most advanced countries have fertility rates that are under two. Um, so the bottom line is you have this inexorable force um, of, of all these people in all these countries and you have, and those are the countries many of which are uh, most um, inclined to e experience natural disasters and whatnot, as well as political instability, right? And that causes this, um, you know, this, this flow, so to speak. So I think as you project this into the future, um, you see that um, there's going to be a, you know, there's going to always be a very, um, a, a very profound problem. And I, I think what will happen is, you'll eventually have the wealthier countries um, making much bigger efforts um, to try to help out um, the rest of the world because it'll become an untenable situation. I mean, the Europeans are already investing in Africa um, to, with the idea of trying to stop illegal migration because they realize that's the only way you can do it is, is if, you, if you raise the level of um, uh, development in these countries. Um. Michael, you have a, Michael Ainsley, did you have a question? Well, I mean, our question is really about the B-1 visas, if there's three times the demand, and you said 35,000 a year. So um, it's actually 85,000, right? So 65,000 are for uh, bachelor degree holders, and then there's another 20,000 for advanced degree professionals, so 85,000. Is there any likelihood of raising that? I mean, it seems so obvious that those are people we want here. Are well, I'll defer to Austin, but my sense is that there's little hope today because there's just such an anti sort of immigrant um, environment mm -hmm. here, you know. And I think that, you know, one, one approach that might be feasible um, with the H 1B category is because where I see, uh, where I personally see the greatest need is with um, the sciences and engineering, right? Um, and all of the H-1Bs are sort of uh, together in one sort of pool or pot. So maybe if the government, if Congress would agree to have a category for IT workers and you know, mm -hmm. have a limited number there and maybe a different set of numbers for <laughs> STEM fields, that would be an approach. But I don't see Congress mm -hmm. raising the numbers now. No, short term, uh, short term, very unlikely. Um, but the rest of the world, right, is really taking advantage of this. The number of foreign student applications is down by about 10% in the U.S., question, yeah. which is tremendous um, negative impact on U.S. universities. Um, and secondly, um, what's happened is, and particularly in the STEM fields, because of the, um, the high marketability um, of, of, of people who want to study in those fields um, and their desire to remain in whatever country it is that they are educated, um, what's happening is they're going to other countries. Um, and Canada has been very aggressive about this. Canada each, even runs ads um, that basically say if you turn down for an H-1B visa, um, or should say if you, if you, yes, if you, if you filed in the lottery and you're turned down, um, come to Canada. We can, you know, we're delighted to have you. Um, so it's, it's um, when, in terms of the, we'll call it competition for talent, global competition for talent, this has to be like the, the worst policy anyone ever adopted. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's unprecedented. Everyone else um, is going out of their way to try to keep foreign students um, and high potential people who went to their universities in their country. Yes? Austin, what do you see, um, what's your sense of what the Supreme Court will do on the DACA? Uh, so the question is, what is yeah. the Supreme Court likely to decide on DACA? Um, I think the Supreme Court is going to decide that um, 
that it was properly rescinded by the Trump administration. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, but I think that they, um, that they might stay, they might stay the um, effectiveness of their order for a considerable period of time to give, um, to give them an opportunity to legislate. Mm -hmm. I do. From, and I judge this based on the questions. Um, there were quite a number of articles about that dealt with what justice asked what questions and, and wh you know, what, what predisposition did it show. Um, and the decision could be that there will be a couple judges who will find that it was properly rescinded and a few that will decide that it was illegal to start with. Um, so it's um, difficult to say, but that would be my prediction. And that'll, that'll force Congress. That's an issue that, um, that President Trump spoken out favorably about, is um, resolving the plight of the DACA recipients. So it'll be interesting with the election coming up to see, um, to see what the calculus is on whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, so we'll see. Well, Gwen and Austin, thank you so much. For a wonderful thank you. Thank you. And, and if we may, on behalf of the Civic Association, we are grateful for your time today, for sharing your insight on the status of immigration, and we have a small gift for you as we appreciate all that you do worldwide, and also we're delighted you're part of our community. if I may say, too, a part of my family. So <laughs> uh, our next program is going to be on January 27th with Michael Ainsley's Book Talk. So please join us on January 17th.